world history. Welcome back. Hope you had a good weekend. Continuing on from last week, where we were learning about imperialism in Asia, we are going to learn about a very different story than what happened in China and in much of the rest of Asia during the imperialist period. We're actually going to be learning about Japan, which had a very different story to the other areas. Um, so just to give you a little hint as to things eventually ended up, you can see, you'll note here on this, it says the Japanese Empire in 1942. This is during World War II in the beginning, uh, around the time when the U.S. came into the war. And all these red areas were under the control of Japan. You might note that some of these were under control of other colonial powers before that. And also just the fact is that Japan became a colonial power, which was, in fact, Different for this time period, most of the other colonial powers were either European or the United States, but Japan became its own colonial power, and we are going to talk about how that ended up happening, how imperial Japan, its imperialism uh, and colonizing, uh, colonizing ideas, moved them around and helped them to eventually take over much of Southeast Asia before their eventual defeat at the end of World War II at the hands of uh, the Allies uh, powers, the Allied powers. So let's start out with feudalism and the Bushido ethic from the 12th to the 19th centuries. Um, first off, there's the shoguns. They were essentially like kings. We're going to really oversimplify the dynastic history of Japan here. But ultimately, Japan, as you can see in this last one here, is an island, or actually a series of islands, really. So uh, the main island here, Hokkaido to the north. Uh, there, is, there are also a bunch of islands down here in the south, including Okinawa which was also independent at different times. So Japan is basically a few islands, which might bring to mind another island power that was strong in imperialism. Yes, that would be England. So again, back to this, the shoguns. The shoguns were like kings in the country. They ruled the country through the daimo, who were like the nobles uh, in, the, in Europe. And they were the heads and controlled the samurai, which were the warrior class. These are depictions of the samurai. They were kind of like Japanese knights. They would uh, rove around and do different activities and tax collection and uh, policing actions for the daimo and in, and the samurai or and the shogun as well. So samurai were a very powerful uh, subclass. They also sometimes would go rogue and they would be uh, they would do their own, they would do their own thing occasionally. And there, there's lots of movies and classic dramas about that. Um, Ronin, I believe, is the name for the uh, for when 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 samurai would go off on their own. The peasants spawned the land in Japan for you know again we're talking 700 years or here or so uh, in exchange for protection by the samurai who operated under a code of conduct known as bushido. So that was chivalry. Again, we're getting into a, a class of people that were a bit like knights. Uh, There's no social mobility in this class in, in this society. It was peasants or the knights or the, uh, you were in the nobility class, or you were the king. It was a lot like feudal Europe. It was a feudal society. We're going to jump ahead here to the Tokugawa shogunate, which was during the Edo period from 1603 to 1868. Um, during the early part of the 1600s, which is the 17th century, the shogunate got word uh, through various early colonial expeditions by Europeans, in particular the Dutch, who were taking over various ports in Asia, uh, they got word that foreign, that foreign traders and missionaries from Europe were actually forerunners of military conquest by European powers. They weren't wrong. They probably had some smart ideas around that. Um, and there was stuff going on where a few missionaries had showed up and Christianity spread in Japan, especially among the, the peasants. And uh, so this was leading to a lot of suspicion by the shogunate uh, to suspect the loyalty of Christian peasants toward their daimo, to their nobles, and severely persecuted different Christian peasants within Japan. Uh, so this was the beginning of a period uh, which was a strong period of isolation, where the Tokugawa shogunate began to shut off uh, different uh, people coming from the West, and from Europe in particular. So there are actually a couple of hundred years, over 250 years, in which there was no visitation allowed from the West. No visitation from the United States, 
or from uh, or from Europe. There was traffic going back and forth between Japan and China and the rest of Asia. But Japan was, it declared its ports off limits to Westerners, which is to say, again, people from Europe and later the United States starting in the 1700s. But let's take a look and guess what was still going on in Japan during this time. Uh, just slowly and gradually as word started coming around, take a look at how people are dressed down here. And this is particularly after an 1852 visit by armed warships from the United States under the command of Commodore Perry. What do you see happening among the Japanese elite down here in this picture to the right? If you guessed that they were picking up Western influence, you are absolutely correct. Uh, Japan was forced under the Treaty of Kanagawa to open its doors. So the commander of the American Asiatic Squadron, which was to say the American missions in uh, China and Southeast Asia, uh, uh, Matthew Perry forced Japan to open its ports to the Western world through military force. They came and they showed, they showed a massive show of force to the shogunate and uh, basically under threat of either overthrowing the shogunate or opening up the Japanese shogunate had to open up to the world. They were humiliated. Uh, there was a there was a series of um, political maneuvers that the uh, that the, that Perry did where they ended up strategically allying with certain uh, nobles in the, in the nobility class who were not too pleased with the shogunate and ended up overthrowing this uh, this situation. So changed it. Japan was humiliated. Uh, there were extraterritorial rights that were going on. So this is basically an exemption from local laws. So historically what this meant is that the imperial powers, in this case the United States, would often force weaker states to grant these exemptions from local laws, these extraterritorial rights, to their citizens who were not diplomats. So soldiers, traders, Christian missionaries, etc., etc., were given the right to be exempted from local Japanese laws. And this is humiliating for Japan. They were uh, facing the prospect of losing their independence and their integrity to imperial powers. They were looking increasingly that they were going to come under colonial occupation. So in response to this, the, uh, there was something happened called the Meiji era, the Meiji Restoration under the emperor, where the noble class and the shogun uh, came back together and began a change from the medieval from the medieval society, the feudal society they had been, into a modern industrialized state. Figuring, uh, hey, maybe there is an idea here, or if you can't beat them, join them. So this Meiji Restoration uh, first off involved moving the new capital from Kyoto to Toko, Tokyo, and uh, this change was happening very quickly. So it was going to be a very fast situation. The shogunate to the emperor, the power passed to the emperor. Of course, the shogunate transferred themselves and the nobles into the military class, which still had a great deal of power. But the Meiji, the emperor was Meiji, and the emperorship was established. Uh, there had long been a figurehead of the emperor uh, within Japan as a spiritual figurehead, but they had held little power. But now the emperor was the spiritual head of the state and elevated Again, though, a lot of the power resided in the military class. So I want you to think about prompt number one here. Why would Japan want to embrace the West and Western ideas after they had practiced isolationism, isolating themselves in the world for so long? Why would they want to do this? So take a pause and write in your notes. Okay, um, by the way, not in your notes, you're actually going to be writing these in your uh, prompts that you have on your worksheet. So hopefully you did that, if not, just cut and paste it. Anyway, Japan embracing the West and Western ideas after they pressed its isolationism for so long. Well, as I hinted in the last slide, Japan picked up very quickly. First off, they picked up very early on the idea that the, the colonial powers were going to be trying to take control of the entire region. And uh, in this case, they decided, okay, we need to industrialize quickly because if we do not do so, we are going to be the next to fall under the chopping block of colonialism and imperialism. In fact, we're going to take it to the next level and become an imperial power ourselves. And in fact, that is what began to happen. So I want you to think right now for prompt number two. 
how does this Japanese interaction with the West compare with the Chinese interaction with the West in this period that you just learned about in the last lecture that we studied under China Opium and Open Door, right? So think about back to the Opium Wars, the Sepoy Rebellion, uh, the Open Door Policy. And I want you to think about the Japanese interaction with the West and how that compared with the Chinese interaction with the West. So you're going to be writing this in your prompts, in your worksheet for the day. Pause and write. Okay. So obviously we learned a lot about what happened with China the other week. And we learned that as China also shut itself off to some extent, it also did not prepare militarily and industrialize as quickly to the same extent that Japan did. They did not uh, react in the same way. So they ended up having a situation where they got their country essentially carved up. And part of this also tied into Japan to in doing incursions, which was going to increase. So Japan became hyper aggressive themselves, industrialized quickly and got their military in a international shape. It also probably didn't hurt that they were an island and were not as easily incurred upon from other areas. So coming from this, we have to start talking about the first Sino-Japanese war. When you see the term Sino in history, that is referring to China. Historically, that is referring to China. So the Sino-Japanese War is the Chinese-Japanese War from 1894 to 1895. China and Japan here. So Japan and China were fighting over this area here in the re in the middle, which was Korea. Now, Japan was a newly emergent power, and it was turning its attention toward Korea, which was bordering both basically between it and China. Russia's extending over here. Um, and it was doing that in its own terms to uh, annex, basically in order to protect its own interest and in security in the region um, against what they saw as marauding colonial powers from Europe and also what they, what they would term as some aggression from China. Um, so they wanted to annex Korea before they would see it being seized by another power. It had been quite a few hundred years, actually, that there had been a Chinese sphere of influence over Korea. Uh, China considered Korea to be a, a kind of like servile state. The the Korea, there wasn't North and South Korea at this time, by the way, it was all one Korea. And uh, Korea would generally side with China as, as a state that was kind of um, dependent on China for trade and, and its various rulership and military backup. Um, so you ended up with a situation where Japan wanted to annex Korea now before it was what they saw as seized by another power, a European power, or the United States in particular, or at least to ensure its effective independence. It did have its own long-running ruling dynasty, which is the Joseon dynasty, uh, and they wanted to help them develop their resources and reform their administration. This is the public line that Japan took for sure. Um, they felt that another power having a military presence on the presence on the Korean Peninsula would have been detrimental to Japanese national security, um, and so they resolved to end this Chinese influence over the region, and well establish their own influence. Of course, it went several steps beyond that, um, in part because Japan realized that having access to Korea's coal and iron deposits would benefit Japan's growing industrial base. So that was one war that was happened in Japan uh, that happened in Japan won it decisively. Followed by this, there was the Russian-Japanese War, the Russo-Japanese War from February 1904 to September of 1905. Russia and Japan fought over control of the Korean Peninsula and Manchuria up here. Manchuria being part of China. So you can see here, back looking at, at the China-Japan uh, War. China was already having a lot of conflicts to deal with, uh, with the UK coming up with the, you know, the US with the Boxer Rebellion and all these situations within the country. And they were not in particularly good state to fight a war. Russia was still an empire at this point. The Russian Revolution had not happened. So Russia was pretty cocky and they thought they were going to be able to do a pretty good, um, pretty good job here of taking over a big chunk of China, which was Manchuria, this area up here. And uh, they wanted a warm water port, as was always the thing with China, with, with Russia. They wanted a port that wouldn't freeze over in the winter for trade and for Navy operations. 
and Japan was looking to ensure their dominance in this region. Um, so this is already part of Russia up here. And so Japan actually, to everyone's surprise, at least the Western world's surprise, uh, Japan whooped the crap out of Russia. They were victorious over them very, very quickly. It lasted for really only uh, about nine months. It was a quick war. So Japan now became this major international player. Russia was super embarrassed. It had significant strategic implications for the Pacific region. Uh, remember, the European powers were not accustomed to being defeated by what they would see as non-European powers. And this also enforced the Western European uh, perception of Russia as being kind of an outlier in Europe, not really European, which is, of course, all this kind of socio-political definitions. Remember, it's all one big continent, right? Russia and Asia. Or not Russia, but uh, Europe and Asia. It's Eurasia. It's one big continent. Um, but this ended up with the destruction of the Russian battle fleet, and it saw the whole balance of power shift in the Pacific. Japan emerged as a ma major military power. New Zealand and Australia, which were part of the greater British Empire, were now anxious about Japanese expansion, worried about the threat posed by the size and mobility of the Japanese fleet. Japan may be small on an island, but so was England. Don't forget about that. We're the most powerful military in the world. So Japan was becoming something very major. And uh, Russia's defeat in this as a sideline was very embarrassing and played a big role in the Russian Revolution that happened as people lost faith in the Russian czars, the Russian regime, which was later replaced by the communist regime at the end of World War I. So let's go into prompt number three. What impact did the Sino-Japanese and the Russo-Japanese War have on Japanese influence in East Asia? This is kind of a review of what we just learned. So go back, look at the slides, think about what we just talked about. Tell me real quick, what impact did it have on Japanese influence in East Asia? Okay, in your, uh, your write-ups, pause. Okay, if you needed to get this answered or validate it, you can go back a couple slides and take a quick look. Um, one way or another, there was a lot of Japanese stuff going on in particular in the area that we're going to be look at, looking at today uh, in Korea. But let's first off take a look here, still looking at what happened with China. I want you to look at prompt number four here. I want you to also think about, find and record the indicators, symbols, and caricatures in this political cartoon. Like, what are these things telling you in the cartoon? What What's, what's the analogy for this cartoon here? Note that the, um, the text at the bottom says, Jap the giant killer. Sorry, that is a racial slur. I apologize for using it. It is a historic use here. Um, and racial slurs are very common during this period as mainstream parlance. Not to say they were right. But that is this, this particular uh, image. I want you to think about what the, who's the giant, who's standing on top, what's happening. What country do you think this cartoon is from? And what is the thesis or argument of this political cartoon? What is it arguing? Okay, pause. All right, hopefully you got some interesting answers there. Could have been a number of possibilities. One way or another, we are talking about Japan taking greater influence in Asia. In this case, uh, with China taking a big fall. To get to China, of course, Japan had to use another area that we talked about a little bit earlier. That would be Korea. This over here says to Manchuria. Manchuria is that region in China that's heavily under dispute. Keeps being fought over by these different colonial powers. And uh, Korea is being used as kind of a bridge here. You can see the Yalu River, which was the... Uh, border between China and Korea. And uh, so obliging. Obliging means to be uh, just letting them go through. So welcome, you know. So you've got the Japanese soldier here and the sign on Korea saying, I hereby grant you a permit to traverse Korean territory. Of course, to cross Korean territory and use it as essentially a military springboard for Japanese interests in China, they had to take over Korea, which had plenty of interests of its own. So there was a Japanese occupation in Korea that was brutal by uh, any standards. 
in, in imperialist standards, colonialist standards in general, but it was to be, it was to prove to be kind of a, uh, a launching point for the brutal Japanese uh, occupations, imperialist occupations that were to happen later uh, in the years leading up to World War II, where they actually ended up, like we saw in the first slide, conquering much of Asia. But um, from 1910 to 1945, the Japanese occupied Korea in a way that resulted in the erasure of Korean culture for the time. Of course, Korean culture, as with most culture in the world, all culture really, um, is resilient. It is not ever truly dead, but people, um, it definitely was a big effort on the behalf of the Japanese to wipe this out. Um, so there was a lot of increased inequity in land ownership. So by 1945, Japan held almost 85% of all property in Korea, of which 83% was owned by the Japanese government or big Japanese business conglomerates called Zaibatsu. Um, Japanese projects in Korea, which were particularly building infrastructure of railroads and roads, they were designed to exploit Korean resources for the benefit of Japan, much like other uh, imperialist projects that the Europeans were carrying out. They dominated banking, trade, mining, communications, and corporate life. The economy was dominated by Japan. Um, Koreans were forced to serve in the military. They worked in the mines and factories. Uh, it was a particularly brutal situation. Uh, here, a quote from a Korean who later became a successful business leader was that a, his father had a big trucking company, but the Japanese took it over and there just wasn't much we could do about it. Uh, railroad lines increased dramatically from 1910 to 1945. The Koreans tended, or the J Japanese tended to come to Korea and take the higher paying jobs. Seoul, the city of Seoul, which is one of the major economic uh, powerhouses in the world today, was renamed Keijio. There's a picture of it. So this is an image of Korean shipments of rice to Japan. Food was exported as Korean hunger and starvation grew. So food was exported from Korea as hunger and starvation grew within the country to Japan. So uh, always a recipe for some unrest. During the 1920s, the Japanese permitted expressions of uh, Korean culture, but by the 1930s, their attitude was that Koreans are now to be Japanese. All indications of a separate Korean culture were to be removed. Uh, they were forced to do mandatory attendance at Shinto ceremonies. Shinto was the Japanese religion. It was based on animistic beliefs and a worship of nature. Um, children had to adopt Japanese customs, culture, and language. In 1940, Adults were told to give up their Korean family names and take Japanese last names. Children could not go to school, and adults could not get jobs unless they changed their names. This is by 1940. Um, also, as we're going to be learning a lot more about, approximately 200,000 women were forced to serve the sexual needs of Japanese troops. These were the so-called comfort women of uh, what was happening at the time. In order to succeed, Many educated Koreans collaborated with the Japanese. Um, in theory, the Koreans were supposed to be Japanese, but there was a double standard in the ways in which Koreans and Japanese were treated. There was a religious occupation that was so profound. As we talked about, Shinto was enforced. Uh, there, were in, there were local religions that were removed. Uh, there's a Korean woman who later settled in the United States who talked about how the Japanese even came and took the brass bowls that they used for their ancestor ceremonies. Uh, Japan encouraged Confucian ideals tied into uh, Chinese religion, classical Chinese religion, but in particular those were for the respect for male authority and for one's elders. Uh, it viewed any efforts to improve conditions for women with suspicion and suppressed them brutally. Um, Christian missionary activities in Korea had actually been historically more successful than in other areas of Central Asia and had not been suppressed as they had in Japan uh, during the, the Tokugawa shogunate. And after the, this, there, there were a lot of Christians in Korea. And after the March 1st, 1919 independence movement, which uh, ended very badly for the Koreans, religious leaders who were connected to foreign religions, quote unquote foreign religions, especially Christianity were persecuted. For example, 3,804 Presbyterian church leaders were arrested, 
47 leaders were shot or beaten to death, and 12 churches were destroyed. Volunteer organizations like the Boy Scouts or Girl Scouts were suspect as well, and these had to be under the direction of the Japanese government. There was a linguistic occupation. So tied into schools, Koreans were not allowed to attend Japanese schools. From a report from a Japanese official describing educational goals for Korea in the 1930s, from this year, the government general is realizing a plan to double the number of primary schools and to extend middle year education, middle school education. The fundamental principles in this peninsula, Korea, are the equal importance of theoretical and industrial education, the significance of citizenship, the exclusion of merely abstract education. We must eliminate the present custom of stressing intellectual training and critical thinking and make the development of our national spirit of Japan, the, ex the essence of education, a nationalist idea versus critical thinking ideas and classical education. Uh, by the 1930s, education was carried out in Japanese. All Korean teachers had to learn and then teach their students in Japanese. The Koreans had their own al alphabet called Hangul, but use of Hangul was outlawed, and all documents were now written in Japanese. Japanese archaeologists uh, are, uh, excavated many ancient sites in Korea and took Korean art and cultural treasures to Japan. The sexual occupation of Korea was uh, particularly sensationalistic and brutal and uh, shameful episode in, historically. The Japanese military kidnapped thousands of Korean girls and women and forced them to serve as comfort women who were raped by Japanese soldiers. Many politicians in Japan, including pr current Prime Minister Shinzo Abe, still refused to accept responsibility for this policy creating a bitter issue between Korea and Japan that, ex that continues to extend into the present. Um, a young woman who was uh, currently an older woman now, leading the movement seeking reparations for Korean comfort women. I think she, this, the uh, woman, I'm sorry, I did not have the specific woman's name right now, who had this quote, um, who's been seeking reparations. Her quote was that I was a young girl during World War II and the Japanese were coming around and offering, quote, good jobs for young women. But my parents were suspicious. They tried to get me married so the Japanese couldn't draft me for work, but I wouldn't do it. So my parents found me a job as a clerk so they could say I was already employed. Some of the young women I knew weren't so lucky. They were taken as comfort women and had to be prostitutes for the army. Many never came back. Politically, there is no freedom of the press. Political parties were abolished. Public gatherings were disallowed. Japanese officials ruled Korea. Jap laws of Japan were enforced. The police had the power to judge, sentence, and execute the accused. Um, after the death of the last Korean ruler, the crown prince was forced to marry a Japanese princess and to live in Japan with only infrequent visits to Korea. To show Japanese power, the Jap Japanese had a huge building erected between the entrance gate and the palace buildings in the old royal palace compound, the Joseon compound. Uh, the building, building towered over the streets of Seoul and later became the National Museum. The National Museum was torn down in 1997 because it was such a painful reminder of the Japanese occupation. During World War II, Japan employed Koreans in its military efforts and they were drafted into the army or had to work in dangerous slave-like conditions. They had, um, they had to fight for them whether they wanted to or not. Harsh army system, many beatings, they threatened your family if you did not obey. Um, Korean officials were fired for their jobs. Japanese officials took their places. There was a major move of immigration from Korea to Hawaii uh, starting in 1903 uh, as the Japanese occupation ramped up. Forced from small farms as the economy went to larger scale production, uh, Koreans emigrated. They got out. Many of them saw the writing on the wall. Uh, by 1945, 11% of Koreans had gone abroad, either by uh, either by fleeing uh, and sneaking out, or having escaped, or having left the country before they were prevented to do, from doing so. Uh, they were going, and they were, many of them worked in sugar plantations in Hawaii, which at this point uh, was a territory of the United States that had recently transitioned from its own country and become a colonial territory of the United States. Many Japanese were also living in Hawaii, but in Hawaii they were under uh, relatively equal conditions in the fields. And these were all peasants uh, and mainly lower class were, uh, peasant farmer people that were working there. Um, there's deals made by the plantation owners to get these Koreans out to work the fields. 
Koreans were enticed because they could keep their culture and language while working the fields, as opposed to what they could do in, uh, in Korea itself. So going into prop number seven here, how might the harsh conditions of Japanese imperialism have changed Korean identity? How might these have changed Korean identity? In your notes of the day, in your prompts, okay, pause and write. Well, they might have changed in a lot of ways, and I'm sure you have a lot of really good ideas about this, but some of the ways are, it led to a rise of Korean nationalism, the formation of the independence movement, the growth of Christianity, interestingly enough, because Christianity is a religion that has traditionally, in many ways, thrived under persecutorial regimes. So Christianity, in fact, grew under, uh, under the regime quietly and underground, and formed a very resilient strain of uh, Christianity that exists today um, in all over the world with many, many uh, Christian Koreans. Uh, there was also the formation, again, of the independence movement, which uh, later also ended up splitting as the country became independent and the Korean War started in the 1950s and the country split into two, but we'll talk about that later. Uh, this also is tied into Korean nationalism, which is this national identity that was forming in response to how harsh the Japanese occupation was. So in 1919 was the first major demonstrations for Korean independence that came out of this. Uh, a major, there, there was largely a peaceful movement that was pushing for Korean independence uh, based on some nonviolent principles that were happening in India and other places. Uh, there were some uprisings as well. It was, it did not go well. The Japanese uh, army and national government had, was singularly brutal in the way that it put, put down, I mean, maybe not singularly, there were other imperial powers that were too, but it was definitely brutal in the way to put it down. Um, military, military execution of Koreans were, uh, was extremely commonplace, and uh, members of the Korean independence movement were arrested and killed. In this image, you actually see Korean Christians who are part of the independence movement who were killed, um, and they are adopting a Christ pose. Uh, as they are about to be shot by Korean, uh, by by Japanese military. So, to recap, uh, the legacy here, uh, not to recap so much, but the legacy of this in the years afterwards. Briefly, we have a situation where Japan is, to today, largely unrepentant. Uh, apologies have been slow and halting and keep getting walked back by different uh, administrations, including the current one under Prime Minister Shinzo Abe. Um, there's omissions from informa about information from the occupations in Japanese textbooks. So there's still very little information in textbooks in Japan uh, about the occupation. There's lingering fears in Korea of Japanese brutality. And a lot of that actually is expressed from the North, which has its own very brutal regime today. But there's still hostility between those countries, whereas South Korea and, J and Japan enjoy an economic relationship, if not necessarily a strong cultural one um, and political one. Uh, there's tension between Koreans, North and South in particular, as a result of collaboration with the Japanese. So also in terms of uh, different people within Korean society today, these tensions continue from families where it's been passed down from generation to generation. Some people who accrued a great deal of wealth during that period maintain that wealth. And uh, some people who did not and were you know, were dis were dis were removed from the property. Um, they are still resentful. There's a lot of continuing resentment. Um, the comfort woman issue from World War II remains a very open open wound that has not been resolved, and uh, hundreds of thousands of women were killed. Uh, the Japanese continued to discriminate against Koreans in Japan. To some extent, that that discrimination continues today. Uh, many Japanese in Japan, or many Koreans in Japan work menial jobs uh, and are in lower socioeconomic classes. Uh, and Japan and Korea still actually are in dispute over uh, Dokodo Island, Dokodo Island, which is in the, uh, in the sea, uh, in the sea between the two of them. So, okay, as we finish this today, uh, I want you to actually go and continue on with your assignment. You are going to actually read the treaty uh, that Japan wrote 
the uh, it's a it's a primary source document. You're going to be reading that treaty today, and uh, you are going to be answering some questions about it. And you'll be doing that and, and turning that in for class along with these prompts on Thursday. And I will talk to you then. We will be doing some review.